Amin Reina here from Sage Investors, and I'm here to do a quick evaluation of a stock called Keg uh, Restaurant Trust or Keg Royalty Trust. Ticker symbol KEG.UN trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, anytime I'm looking at a stock or I'm trying to analyze a stock, you got to answer some basic fundamental questions about the business. And once you have a pretty good idea where the business is and where they are and what the risks are associated, you should have a pretty good idea of whether you want to get into the stock or not. Uh, in the case of uh, the keg, uh, which, I'll, uh, which I'll get into in a sec, um, first thing you need to understand about the company is that it's not like your traditional business in the sense, in terms of how it's structured and how it's operated in the sense that it's, it's an income trust. In the sense that, here's the keg, any money that comes into the keg and cash, in terms of cash flow, the keg essentially pays it out goes out of the company and goes to the unit holders and the shareholders. So what the problem with that is that there's very low cash on hand to, you know, fund growth or, you know, reinvest in the company. And you need to understand that because that kind of filters into how you how you look at the company. So let's get into the keg. First thing we always need to ask ourselves as investors is, what do they do? What's their value proposition? What do they sell? Um, what are products? What services do they sell? What makes them unique uh, compared to other other organizations, other businesses out there? So when we look at the keg, essentially what they are is they're just a restaurant. They're just a restaurant chain. They're just a restaurant chain. Um, and essentially they're what they sell is they're they're a steakhouse. Steak is steak and potatoes is their is their staple. Um, they have, you know, 100 stores, mostly in Canada, pretty much in Canada. Um, and what they offer is kind of like that, uh, you know, a modern, um, you know, a modern atmosphere, you know, with, with you know, quality, quality food and, uh, you know, and the whole social aspect and a very social urban vibe um, environment. Um, second question we ask is we usually ask is who are the competitors? Is this is are they the only steakhouse in town and in, in out there, or are there other similar competitors? And the, the answer is there's quite a few competitors out there. There's you know we can get into the local ones, of course, but other similar type chain restaurants that are publicly traded perhaps also are places like Highs, uh, Morton's, uh, Ruth Chris. Um, then there's other similar kind of urban-y restaurants, chains like Moxie's, uh, Milestones. Um, so there's a lot of space. It's a very competitive um, space for, you know, the entertainment dollar, competing for entertainment dollars and disposable income. Who are their customers? What's a typical keg customer? Who would go to a keg restaurant? Well, it turns out there's a quite a dynamic, a quite a, a range of people um, that would go to it. Um, it does cater to family families. There's, there's a family oriented uh, um, component to it. Families, you see a lot of families there. You also see a lot of professionals. Again, because of that urban vibe that they offer, a lot of professionals, a lot of business people. Um, people in there. Um, if you go into a keg, if you go into the bar section, they do have a sport, kind of a sports bar kind of feel, lounge kind of feel. So, you know, they appeal to quite a few segments in the demographic. But I, I think at the end of the day, if you go into a keg restaurant, it does, I think, cater more towards uh, uh, more of an, I would say, more older, middle, um, maybe a Gen X kind of boomer kind of kind of crowd um, then I would say more like a millennial crowd not to say that millennials wouldn't go to a place like this or you know I see quite a few of them but I would say that more family oriented um, more professional type people now the question is great they go to it but do they frequent the keg on a regular basis would they come back over and over again and my answer is I would say yes purely because of an anecdote that I have in the sense that I went to an airport I went to an, a keg near an airport and I thought we thought it would be really dead. There's like 15 of us, and uh, it was packed at 4:30 in the afternoon. 
and this place was packed and it was crazy and we couldn't even get it we couldn't get a table we couldn't even sit all together it was it's funny and so if it's packed at that particular time imagine what this place is like in a real centralized rural or urban kind of downtown you know suburban setting it's probably even crazier um, that this was just at a remote airport location near the airport so i would say that they have a pretty loyal um, following um, in terms of their customer base now that's all great and good but at the end of the day as investors you know we want to look for companies to invest in that are demonstrated ability to create tangible wealth can actually make money so that leads to the next question we always need to ask ourselves is do they make money and if the answer is yes then we want to kind of dive in a little bit further with the business but if they don't then that's kind of where we want to stop because we don't want to invest in businesses that are losing money or destroying shareholder wealth so when we looked at the keg um I looked at it from a comparable perspective. Um, if you look at them, and when we look at measuring financial performance, the core metric we want to look at is uh, is return is uh, return on invested capital, and we want to compare it to the company's cost of capital. So in two thousand and I'm going to use sixteen, the company generated about set with return on invested capital was seven point four percent. And we estimated their cost of capital to be between 12 and 14%. So when you factor it in this way, the company's destroying tangible wealth, and I would kind of want to stop looking at it. But then we looked at the 2017 numbers, and their growth rate came, their return on invested capital then jumped to almost 11%, and you compare that to the cost of capital of 10. And I'm going to kind of get into this, the numbers of the rationale of why those numbers are in a second, because we need to look at the next question, which is looking at the financial perform, uh, the, the financial position of the company, the company's balance sheet. So if we look at the company's balance sheet for 2016 and look at some key metrics, one of the key metrics that jumped out with, uh, with the keg is that 72, oops, get that back here. Suck. Here we go. Seventy-two percent of the company's assets were in goodwill, were in tangible assets, which is really too high. They had um, two million in cash, in cash, and they had double current. Their current ratio was at two, two times their current um, liabilities, and they had a debt level, debt to equity level of zero point one six, which is very low. So they were heavily equity oriented and that kind of translates into why in 2016 they had a much higher cost of capital because they carried much more equity in their in their capital structure which then feeds into a higher risk premium in terms of their cost of capital when we look at their performance in 2000 their position in 2017 uh, they had they dropped it because they they re capitalized the business or restructured their business from a financial side of it. They're, they went from 72% goodwill, uh, 72% of their assets in goodwill, down to literally 1.2% 1, 1. In, in, in 2017. Their cash level went from 2 million to 29 million in cash, but their current ratio then went down to under one, which is a little bit concerning from a liquidity perspective. But their debt level, increase quite dramatically and so when you factor that in the higher level of debt which is from a cost of capital perspective cheaper that feeds into their lower cost of capital and when you look at their 2017 performance it's much better than their 2016 in the sense that they are generating slightly higher return on invested capital greater than their cost of capital so they're essentially just kind of almost breaking even from that perspective um, so Financial performance-wise, nothing spectacular, nothing great, um, just kind of so-so. And but the key thing here is the nature of the the way the business is structured. It's much more heavily uh, a lot of debt. So then, when we start looking at some of the risks associated with the business, um, one of the big risks is is the increased debt could potentially with. Um, higher interest rates. If interest rates keep going up, that's going to mean increased costs 
which could lower profits. Um, other sides of it, you have to look at, you know, the nature of restaurants, it's sort of cyclical. It's really sensitive to the economic, sensitive to the economy. You got to look out for that side of it too. The company could be entering, a, if it enters in a rough patch, and you can see right now, economy has been booming in the last while, and if they're generating so-so mediocre returns, if things get really worse in the economy and people's consu consumption habits change, um, or get reduce their consumption, that's going to impact companies like the keg, like restaurants, because it's cons it's disposable income that they're using. Um, the other side of also, as I said earlier, um, they kind of take their demographic is catered more from a Gen X to a Boomer side of it. As I said, um, you know, millennials are getting more and more prevalent now as in as consumers. Um, you know the demographics can 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 they appeal to a younger crowd to a younger demographic that's a risk because a lot of studies have shown and a lot of market research has shown that millennials just don't eat out as much um, compared to other generations and so if millennials pull back their spending and redirect their spending to other things that can impact the keg uh, down the road too and also, you know, the fact of the matter is, and I think that plays also to the, you know, they are essentially a premium, um, a premium product and essentially a premium pricing. Um, they do are more upscale um, service and, you know, restaurant in that sense. So is that going to do with, you know, people more strapped in terms of debt? Are they going to go out to the places like the keg and spend like a couple of hundred dollars on a, on a, on a dinner or on a meal um, as frequently as maybe they have in the past. That's a risk that we have to look at. Finally, so we know a little bit, we know a little bit about the company and I think we feel, I feel pretty good about the company because just from going to one and I go there, you know, not every time, but whenever I go there, it's always packed. It's always busy. Um, they, they definitely offer a premium product um, people are there, you know, literally at all times during the day. The only side of it is just when you get into the financials and the type of performance they're generating is not that great. And the way that the company is structured right now, it's very debt focused. And that pretty much puts it at a risk of being, you know, if the economy slows down, uh, interest rates go up as they are, it can make the company a bit vulnerable for, from a financial position. Now, Part of all this, why it's doing this, is it comes back to how the company is structured. Because when the company, as an income trust, all the money that comes in immediately gets sent out to investors, and there's very little reinvestment. So, if the company were to be a, tr you know, organize itself as a traditional kind of business, I think they would have a lot more. Their financial statements and I think their financial performance would be much much higher. I think the fact that they're in this type of structure is holding back on a lot of performance. So when I look at the company from a valuation perspective, um, right now the company is trading at, if you look at it, it's about trading at 23 times, uh, you know, its PE is trading at about 23, which is pretty expensive. Um, as a div, but the fact that what makes the keg appealing to investors is because it's an income trust, it offers a much higher yield and, uh, and makes it appealing. And right now, I look at the stock price right now, the stock has been, it's down 15% from, from its recent, more recent highs. So that's, I thought it would be an interesting company to look at because of its pulled back and because of the uh, higher yield. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I really like the store. I like the restaurants. I think they're great restaurants. They're great to good. And I think you get a really good experience out of it. But what I think bothers me is the way the company is structured. And because of that, I think it's holding back a lot of potential performance here. And I think it's holding back a lot of, flex of flexibility for the company to reinvest and actually get become bigger and potentially become a lot more profitable. So if you're asking me and then to pay a higher premium for this kind of mediocre uh, performance just doesn't seem to make sense for me. So my decision at the end of it, after an analyzing the company here is really like the company I don't like the performance. And so if I were to make a decision here whether I would want to buy or sell the stock or buy the stock, I would 
I would essentially say uh, I would not buy the stock. So there you go. That's my analysis of the keg restaurants. Thanks a lot for listening. My name is again is Amin Reina from Sage Investors.